Hello and welcome to my in-depth video on abyssal creatures. This is mainly meant to guide you to the advanced methods of how to optimally AFK them using revolution with the math covering the rates that you'll expect. I highly suggest watching the entire video as I leave specs of information across the viewing that might be useful for whatever you're planning on doing. Without further ado, let's get right into it. So first, let's look at the method of getting into the Sentistan Asylum. You can either use the Archaeology Journal to teleport to the Archaeology Guild, then using the dig site map inside and pressing N for Sentistan dig site. You could also use the Archaeology Teleports to teleport directly to the dig site, but it's not worth the price. Once there, you want to run towards the northeast corner of the map, down two sets of stairs and finally operate the elevator. There is a gate between the savages and the lords which requires a key commonly dropped by the lords. Don't forget when unlocking this shortcut to bring a rope as you'll need it only once to be able to descend. Let's move on to archaeology relics. If you're slaying you want slayer introspection. If you're doing clues you want abyssal link unless you're willing to switch your relics between gathering and solving clues. In terms of damage, conservation of energy is the best, especially when using magic. If you don't have that, then Fury of the Small is a good substitute. I wouldn't recommend using Death's Ward if you're planning to fully AFK, since in the long run, if you're expecting to drop down to 50 or 25% HP, this won't consistently save you if you're not paying attention. Font of Life acts as a pretty good filler relic if you only have a few points left with one more available slot. Lastly, Luck of the Dwarves is decent if you don't have conservation of energy since you'll have to stick with using Ring of Vigor. Continuing on with Invention Perks. For most of these armor setups, you can use whatever you normally use for PVM, but I'd recommend switching out where you normally have Enhanced Devoted 4, 4 Genocidal and Demon Slayer, which will only cost you a couple of mil. You'd probably also have Devoted Couple of Impatient, but since you'll always be using Soul Split, it won't make much of a difference if you don't. When doing Lords with Ganodermics, you'll want to be using Biting 3, Absorptive 4, Crystal Shield 4, and Genocidal with Demon Slayer. Some variants should be fine, but keep in mind that this is what I've tested and this is what works, so be sure to use it as a firm guideline. Crackling won't do much since single target damage isn't very effective when it comes to AoE focused DPS. Relentless also isn't very effective since you won't be making much use of the excess adrenaline when AFK with revolution. However, it can be useful if you don't have conservation of energy relic to make up for the adrenaline that you'd otherwise save. For the weapon perks, you can again just use your normal PVM setup. You will probably have Precise 6 with either Aftershock 1 or Ruthless 1, but it won't have a significant impact if you don't. The only unconventional and major change you have to make is if you're AFK using magic with Greater Chain, you'll have to have Chroming 4 on your staff. Lastly, if you're slaying a lot with melee, it's definitely worth having Equilibrium 4 Ruthless 3 on your Lanakir Spear. Moving on to the part that should help you the most, action bars. You almost always want your main damage increasing ultimates at the front. With magic you want greater chain right after sunshine as it's your main DPS output. Using the inside fear spell is a must, not only for reducing the tsunami adrenaline cost down to 40%, but for the activation which hits a 5x5 target for 30% damage, which is especially good at clearing the tentacles at abyssal lords. Don't worry too much about the rune cost as you'll only be using 300 soul runes at most per hour. The intent of having Omni Power that far in front in the action bar is to couple it with Greater Chain. With this setup, Omni Power was used with Greater Chain 64% of the time from my hours testing. If you don't have Magma Tempest, then just ignore it but keep the same bar. And if you're on Slayer Task, you can move Tusker's Wrath further up but no further than any AoE ability. The only notable mention for melee is that I recommend to have the tier 2 Cobucular Rex perk from Ranch Hour Time which increases the critical hit chance of Meteor Strike by 40%. The reason Cleave is so far up in the bar is to more efficiently rotate AoE abilities rather than bursting all the AoE thresholds off cooldown with not much to space afterwards. Finally, before we move on to the numbers, let's look at some alternatives that you can swap out from the setups I'm going to show you. Most of them are pre-self-explanatory, insignificant downgrades or upgrades, so I'm going to skim through the list. 
I would only recommend using Dew Wield over a Staff or Magic if you don't have Magma Tempest and you already own a pair of Dew Wields, which shouldn't be the case for most people since Dew Wields are more expensive and harder to obtain. Next armor is actually more efficient to use than tier 90 armor in almost all cases, purely due to the exorbitant upkeep prices. When using magic, you'll need the Zuck cape, but the hybrid variant is not necessary. However, when using melee, you can use almost any cape you want since you won't be needing the Zuck cape passive. If you want to use the scripture of Bic to farm clue scrolls while slaying, feel free to do so. I would generally not recommend switching to Luck of the Dwarfs from the Ring of Vigor unless you're farming clue scrolls. You can use Demon Horn Necklace coupled with the attuned Ectoplasmator, which automatically scatters the dropped Infernal Ashes and restores your prey, making it completely AFK. However, you might want to add more tank armor to your setup to test the waters, and I don't think it's possible to couple it with the budget setup at Abyssal Lords, since it relies on the increased healing from Amulet of Souls. Alright, let's start with the actual Slayer mobs. First up is the Abyssal Lord. Let's look at the cannon spot. Now, for future references, the letter P is where the player stands and the letter C is where the cannon is placed. The number next to the arrow is the number of tiles you move from the player spot to the cannon spot. Lastly, all of these cameras are faced south. So for Abyssal Lords, the purpose of the cannon is not only to aggro, but more importantly to force them to teleport to you, since they don't have a 100% chance of doing so with every hit, and it's important to have the Lords clumped up for AoEs to be more effective. Remember, the more damage you do, the more you heal with Soul Split, and you'll take less damage since there'll be fewer Lords attacking you at a time. This however does leave you defenseless against the tentacles, but yields significantly more kills per hour. As you can see based on this image, the reason you're up against the wall is to limit the circumference at which the tentacles can spawn and the lords can teleport to, which concentrates the range of your AoE abilities much more effectively. At first glance, these numbers are nuts. Let's look at the first setup. If you're actively trying, then you want to attack the abyssal lords who have yet to teleport to you, while using greater chain on cooldown on the ones who have teleported to you, comboed with omni power, tsunami, wild magic, detonate, or dragon breath in that prioritized order. If you run out of abilities by mistake, you could always use Guthic Staff if you have an EOF. Looking at example 2, you can AFK with full Ganodermic, Noxious Staff, tier 95 Prey and no Magma Tempest and yield just over 2 mil Slayer XP per hour. It's insane! You can swap out Ganodermic Gloves for Cinder Banes, but you won't survive 100% of the time if you're AFKing. When I did it in this example setup, I had to eat a Sailfish every 6 minutes to survive. The clue scroll rates are a very early estimate provided by Salty with a sample size of 5k kills, so take it with a grain of salt. But combining the quantity with how many elites Triskelions provide, it adds up to a competitive amount. Lastly, before we move on, this can be a disadvantage depending on how populated dungeons are, but I would not do lords in your player owned dungeon as you'll lose a huge amount of kills per hour due to the reason of not being able to use a cannon. I've made sure to keep the GP rates of normal and unique drops completely separate, indicated respectively by the pile of coins and scourge or jaws icon. This is important since you're expected to hit the average GP rate for normal but not unique drops. Regardless, it is the best form of measurement to make a decision on. Another point I would like to make is that the scripture of full uptime is pretty high and you're expected to receive roughly 6% more damage when doing slay with high amounts of outgoing hits. This is why I have so many tank armor slots even in a best in slot setup, because the damage output of the scripture of full ends up being more than the power armor that I could substitute it for, and it's cheaper. Obviously, it's not realistic to create every possible setup for these slayer mobs, so try using these examples as bearings to what is possible. If you're taking too much damage, then the first thing you want to do is switch out the scripture of full. If you're still struggling on sustaining yourself with just soul split, then try swapping out some power armor for tank. Moving on to beasts and first looking at the cannon spots. You can actually use all three types of cannons here with the orange indicating off slayer task elite clue scroll farming which you use a dwarf multi cannon. 
and red indicating on Slayer Tasks, which you use Coil all by placing a Kinetic Cyclone under where you'll be standing, which is arguably better than Coil if you're on task, since beasts automatically aggro for the first 10 minutes, and Abyssal Beast Slayer Tasks don't usually last much longer than that. Abyssal Beasts are also viable and much better in the player owned Slayer Dungeon if you plan to AFK at all, as these mobs will occasionally force you to move and in the Asylum Dungeon, your kills per hour plummets as the amount of Abyssal Beasts you are able to hold aggro drops from 6 to 4, which pushes your kills per hour less than what you can get fully AFKing in your player owned Slayer Dungeon even considering the use of cannon. Alright, let's move on to the juicy numbers. The XP rates are pretty solid for the 105 Slayer requirement, but the gem within these numbers isn't the XP or the GP, it's the Elite Clue Scroll rate. These rates are a staggering 65% higher than Shadow Creatures, which is a colossal jump. I decided not to include the rates of tryharding as the difference wasn't enough to warrant putting in that effort. Although I've included separate rates of kills per hour and elite clue scrolls per hour when using the same setup in a player owned slayer dungeon with 5 abyssal beasts in a small room. In hindsight I would suggest using Amina Souls over an essence of finality if you already have one for any setup as it's cheaper to use and almost provides the same damage output. Melee is very much viable abyssal beasts and as you can see by these numbers they're right behind the kills per hour of magic. If you're on Slayer Tars and Lankir Spear is extremely powerful, almost achieving the same kills per hour of best in slot magic for a much cheaper price tag. However, if you're off task, you're forced to use Noxious Scythe due to accuracy reasons, which pushes it further under the rate of magic and ends up ultimately being 12% less kills per hour, which is still pretty good if that's all the gear you have. Finally, moving on to Savages. Now, the reason the cannon is positioned in this location is so that the rotational shots aren't all soaked into the pile of savages that are already aggroed onto you. The reason for this is like any situation where you would use a cannon over a coil. Grabbing long range aggro ends up yielding more kills per hour than the damage output of the cannon choice. There's honestly not much to say on Abyssal Savages. They seem pretty decent Slayer XP Prowl for a level requirement of 95, and they do drop the most amount of Abyssal Flesh per hour by far, but worth noting is that if you do any of these Abyssal creatures off Slayer Task, you get roughly one third of the Abyssal Flesh you normally would on Task. These Abyssal creatures don't naturally aggro, so you want some form of aggro pot. In these examples and the off task beast ones, I'm using aggro overload as it's 18% cheaper than if you were to use overloads alongside aggro pots. I don't think there's a reason to do these off task since they're not very lucrative and there's no point doing them in your player owned slayer dungeon since the normal dungeon is most of the time vacant and much better. The last slide is on Iron Man related drops. Now, I'm a little out of field here as I don't know the current metas of how certain resources are gathered, nor do I imagine that any of these drops will be incentive alone to make an Iron Man farm these mobs. Nevertheless, I thought it'd be interesting. You gain 16% more pure essence per hour doing lords over beasts off slayer task at just under 8.5k per hour with the AFK method. The high level herbs consist of Irrit, Toadflax, Avento, Dwarfweed and Canatine, with all of them at equal drop rates. And that's it for this video on Abyssal Creatures. I know this is a very late release relative to the content launch, but I wanted the information to be as accurate and reliable as possible, and I had to redo a lot of my test due to adjustments. This also might have been information overload, but I try to include all the hows along with the whys of these methods while also keeping it as compact as possible. So let me know if you have any feedback to improve future videos like this. Lastly, I want to thank all of the following for helping me make this video. I will include their information in the description below. One thing I love about this community is that we're always willing to take the time to help one another. And a lot of this happens behind the scenes when creating content. Anyways, that's it from me. Thank you for watching and take care.